Hello, and welcome to the, this Bright Talk webcast presented by the Fiber Channel Industry Association. Today our topic is on fiber channel cabling. I'll be your moderator today. My name is Mark Jones from Broadcom Limited. And our expert panelists that will be discussing in detail the topics of fiber channel cabling are Greg McSorley from Amphenol Corporation and Zach Nason from Data Center Systems. So this, this webcast today on fiber channel cabling is for anyone with questions concerning cabling in a fiber channel environment, specifically those who are directly or indirectly responsible for SAN cable plant design based on either 16 gig GFC fiber channel or Gen 6 32 GFC fiber channel platforms. Our topics will include fiber channel plant cable design process, uh, common cabling components, copper and fiber op optics breakdowns, reusing optics, bit error ratios. The topics that will not be discussed today are polarity, the upper fiber channel layers, uh, link loss budgets, and just about everything else that's not related to the core topic of fiber channel cabling. Okay. Um, so one of the common questions we get all the time in the, in the industry is, how do I design a cabling infrastructure for a fiber channel storage area network? And to give us some idea on how that is put together, I'll pass this over to Zach. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, everyone, for being here today. Uh, this is a great question to begin with that anyone setting up a fiber channel environment inevitably has to answer. I'll start by saying congratulations on your choice of a fiber channel storage area network. You've chosen, in my opinion, the best option for storing your bits in the data center market. An open standard interface that merges the performance and reliability of local storage with the connectivity and distance of networks. So now that you've chosen your servers, storage, and switches, it's time to start planning for how you'll connect those devices. The cabling infrastructure, and by cabling infrastructure, I mean all the equipment connecting your devices. The cabling infrastructure now becomes the most important piece of your installation, management, and service of your storage area network. There are many ways to interconnect the fiber channel environment, so keep in mind all the variations. In the building, the cable is located in, the products chosen, the installers and schedules chosen, and the cabling uh, what the cabling is currently connecting to and how it could potentially connect and what types of data traffic will be moving over the infrastructure. All these variables will affect your ability to build a cost-effective and reliable cable plant. So it's good to keep in mind a design goal to ensure simplicity in management, feature expansion, and serviceability. So let's talk network topology. Fiber Channel was designed in a way where storage and server devices with Fiber Channel Host Bus Adapters, or HBAs, which are devices connecting hosts to the storage area network. Fiber Channel was designed in a way where once everything is connected, it begins to assign names to devices and run practically automatically, at least from a cabling perspective. So planning a network topology really starts by deciding what size is needed based on data stored and expected traffic across the network, and how much change will occur as far as adding and subtracting devices onto the network. As both the network size and the need for scalability, scalability increase, a robust network including multiple tiers of fiber channel switches becomes necessary. A typical SAN design comprises devices on the edge of the network, switches in the core, and network typically, and such as on the core of the network, typically separated by in redundant fabrics and the cabling that connects it all together. Network topology is usually described in terms of how the switches are interconnected, such as a ring, edge core, and edge core edge, or fully matched. Each of these four topologies shown has benefits and costs associated with them. Scenario A has a localized traffic which can have small performance advantages, but does not provide ease of scalability or manageability. Scenario B, also called edge core, separates the storage and servers, thus providing ease of management and moderate scalability. 
scenario C, as known, also known as edge core edge, has both storage and server servers on the edge switches, which provides ease of management and is very scalable. Scenario D is a full mesh topology, and the server to storage is no more than one hop. So the difference between the four scenarios is device placement, or where the devices are attached to the network, and the associated traffic flow. All right. I'm sorry that that picture is a little messed up. Uh, now that we have an understanding of variables involved in designing cable plant and fiber channel network topologies, it's important to keep in mind that the links in between devices may involve multiple cables and connections. This added complexity in the cable infrastructure helps decrease the complexity in the managing and scaling the network, giving the network some structure physically to build upon. And finally, uh, try to visualize a cabling infrastructure as being on a spectrum between a fully scalable, manageable, and structured methodology, and a completely congested, inconvenient, and unstructured methodology. All cable plants are unique to the variables of the network, and no cable plant is perfect. So remember, no matter which design you choose, the goal is to ensure simplicity for easier management, future changes, and serviceability. And I'll pass it back to Mark. Okay, great. Good, good, Zach. That was uh, that was some great information. I, I guess the next question really is, you know, what are some of the co common cabling components for fiber channel? I know, Greg, you're you're, you're kind of an expert in this area. Can you, can you help us understand this? Yeah, I don't know if "expert" is the right word, but yes, I can certainly try to help out. Thanks, Mark. Um, the, the really one of the nice things about fiber channel over its history is kind of the simplicity of of how we've done it from, from, from generation to generation. I mean, at the box, um, the two basic interconnects that we've used since Gen 2 is, uh, you know, SFP and the QSFP interconnects. And you can use those in the uh, intradata center links over twin X cables or multimode fiber. And generally for the, you know, cross the whole data center type thing in your interdata center, you would use single mode fiber. And I, I want to direct you to, there was a, a really great uh, webinar done before, uh, or a webcast done before by Fiber Channel on the uh, um, long distance fiber channel. So that's a really good one to, to check out too. Um, I'm going to get into some of this other uh, interconnect later, but for now we'll leave it at that. Thank you. All right, great. Thanks, Greg. Uh, so now that we know about fiber channel cabling methodologies and components, you know, what are some of the, um, uh, what is structure cabling and why is that important? Zach, can you help us understand that? Yeah, sure. So uh, structure, structure connectivity in fiber channel environments allows for rapid connection and cable management switches to servers and storage devices and enables the data centers to plan for the evolution and growth of IT infrastructure. Uh, structured cabling consists of a number of standardized smaller elements, hence structured, uh, calling, called subsystems. Within those subsystems, intermediate link connections are made at patch panels to accommodate reconfiguration. The number and quality of these connections determine the connector loss, or the loss of signal power of the link. Uh, in the image to the right, uh, it illustrates how trunk cables are terminated at patch panels with MPO or LC connection. Trunk cables typically have between 12 or 300 fibers and extend over long distances within a data center. The trunk cables are terminated with LC or MPO connections that connect to the back of the patch panel. In a one rack unit or a one RU patch panel drawn, uh, there are three types of patch panel modules uh, that are supported. Uh, the one on the back left, uh, the LC to LC module is a type of patch panel requiring trunk cables with LC termination. Uh, this one offers the lowest connector loss of any of the patch panel modules. The one in the middle, the LC to MPO module, so also called an MPO to LC cassette, and converts MPO trunks, trunk cables to LC connections. Uh, this module type adds two connections to the link. And on the right, uh, MPO to MPO modules support MPO trunk cables 
and each MPO connection supports 8 to 12 fibers. The most common MPO connector supports 12 fibers or a base 12, while other versions like 8 fiber base 8 are growing in popularity. Uh, these three type of patch panel modules support trunk cables terminated with MPO or LC connections. The trunk cables plug into the back of the patch panel modules with LC or MPO patch cords connect and connect to the front of the patch panel. Uh, this mo modular patch panel architecture enables that e easy installation and scales well. So when I say structured cabling consists of a number of, number of standardized smaller elements, by standardized I mean proper cabling infrastructure is governed globally by a handful of standards organizations. Uh, these groups are relevant to our topic today and it is well worth your time to investigate uh, along with fiber channels. So the, the results of structure cabling is that all switches, servers, and storage throughput uh, throughout the data center are represented by individual ports on the front of patch panels in a centralized patching location, often called a main distribution area, or MDA. Uh, connecting two ports is accomplished by a simple patch cord or a jumper cable on the front side of the patch panels at the MDA, allowing for instant device-to-device -device connectivity. Uh, with, with this approach, IT personnel never have to manipulate active equipment, such as switches, unless a hardware change is necessary. So, in conclusion, structure cabling makes networks easy to document, manage, and grow with the current and future demands of fiber channel connections. Pass it back to Mark. All right, thanks, Zach. Um, I guess you know one of the questions that that comes up a lot after after talking about uh, structured cabling and everything is where does copper cables fit in? Uh, you know, are there copper cables in fiber channel? Greg, can you uh, help us understand that? Well, I can certainly try, Mark. Thank you. Um, yeah, actually, copper cabling has been in fiber channel since the beginning. Um, Back in the old loop days of arbitrated loop, we had, you know, copper cables running from uh, storage box to storage box and that kind of thing. But after we moved on to uh, cut through switches and stuff, we went, went more to direct connect. And since then, we've been using, as I said earlier, the the, uh, the SFP connector. But when we do when we do talk about copper in this respect, we're not talking about twisted pair or category cable. We are talking about to an axial type of cable, which is, has much better loss properties, or, not, or lack of loss, if you will. Um, because the biggest problem you have is, is in getting the length and the distance of any of these uh, cables is the insertion loss. And you can see there, there's the insertion loss. This uh, <laughs> definition is right out of the fiber channel spec. And it's a bit wordy, and it gets into you know the whole frequency range and everything else. But, what it really is is a matter of you know how much signal do you have at the end of your media, whatever it might have been, um, going into the receive. And if it's not enough, then obviously you don't get you know the signal or the bit through. So over the years, we've employed better and better um, to an axial type of cable. If you look at the bottom right corner, since fiber channel uses a differential signaling, you have um, two two wires, if you will, a pair per signal. You have a transmit pair and a receive pair. And they're individually wrapped, um, and they're wrapped in such a way that um, it cuts down on perturbations so you don't have as much loss. If you look to the graph on your left, you'll see after about 10, 11 gigahertz, some cables start to fall off in that loss plot, whereas some others with better construction go all the way out to 20 gigahertz at a very nice, smooth loss. So what this allows us to do is, because we have this uh, cable without the, as much loss, it allows us to actually, come on forward. It allows us to do this kind of thing, where inside the rack, you can have a top of rack switch or a mid, mid rack switch. And as you can see, you can have you know pot, passive copper cables uh, up to like three meters, depending on um, 
the construction, the loss, the whole the whole bit. Obviously, you have to stay within the within the link budget, but you can do it in a lot of areas, and and it's a much more inexpensive way to do um, some of that internal rack type of, of connections. Obviously, you still need your optical up top. You know, going back to Zach's structured cable, but you can certainly do it in this fashion, and a lot of people do because it is um, a much more inexpensive way to handle a lot of that. So copper cables, um, while get limited as the, as the speeds go up, there are still ways to do it, and we're going to continue to use copper in the future. Thanks, Mark. All right, thanks, Greg. Um, so thanks for that information on copper cables. I guess that tees us up now for the next question, that is, what is optical fiber, and how does optical fiber work? Uh, Zach, can you help us out with that? Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to make sure everyone is um, prepared. I'm going to break it down to a very uh, uh, rudimentary level and then bring it back up a little bit, but uh, just bear with that a little bit. So I'm going to start by with the very basics of fiber optic transmission. So ultimately, fiber is nothing more than a waveguide for light. Uh, all that means is that light goes in one end and comes out the other. Is commonly made of glass or silica, but it can also be made with plastic. Uh, but why do we use fiber in the first place? Well, it's really, um, it's really low cost in terms of other materials, especially at longer distances. It's extremely lightweight and it's very flexible and can carry a tremendous amount of information. So today we have 20 terabit systems all over the place and there, there's, that's only going to go up from there. You can easily carry lots of independent signals with it. So you can do things where you add capacity over time, add channels over time, add customers over time, and they won't interfere with each other. Uh, it lets you carry these signals for thousands of kilometers without having to regenerate the signal. And ultimately, techno technology continues to get better and better. And we have fiber and cable pathways that were originally running one gigabit fiber channel and are now running 16 gig, 32 gig, and higher fiber channel. So fortunately, the technology of glass doesn't change too much. We just get better and better with what we put on it. So a quick flashback to high school physics. Uh, when light propagates through a vacuum, it theoretically it's theoretically the fastest, uh, fastest thing that we can ha happen in the known universe, right? So uh, that speed is called C, and it's roughly 300 million meters per second. And for shorthand mass, you can call it 300 kilometers per second. But when that light passes through a material that is not a perfect vacuum, it propagates slower. So the speed that light propagates through a material relative to, vac to a vacuum is called a refractive index. So for example, water has a refractive index of 1.33. So that means that as light propagates through water, it, it is 1.33 times slower than when light propagates through a vacuum. So what happens when light tries to pass from one medium to another with a different index of refraction is that you get a reflection instead. So if you've ever looked up underwater and you've seen a reflection down, that's what you're seeing. So it works like this. Uh, it's a principle called total internal reflection. Uh, inside your fiber, you actually have two different types of glass. You have a core and a cladding, and they have different refractive indexes. So what happens is when the light comes in and it tries to go outside of the core, when it tries to leave the core and hit the cladding, that different index of refraction causes it to be reflected back. That's what keeps the light inside the fiber and keeps it from keeps it propagating down the fiber instead of leaking out the sides. And that happens as long as the light enters the core within a certain angle, what's called an acceptance cone. And so here are a few definitions uh, we're going to touch on briefly. Um, the attenuation uh, or transmission law finds how light is reduced with respect to distance traveled. The reflectance or return law defines how much light is reflected back to the transmitter. And connector loss defines how much light is reduced through a connection. 
Uh, prior to designing or installing a cabling system, a loss budget analysis is recommended to make certain that the system will work over a proposed link. Uh, that same loss budget will be used to compare test results after installation of the cabling to ensure that the components were installed correctly. Uh, the terms, so the terms power budget and loss budget are often confused. Um, the power budget refers to the amount of loss that a data link or transmitter to receiver can tolerate in order to operate properly. Sometimes the power budget has both a minimum and a maximum value, which means that it needs at least a minimum value of loss so that it does not overload the receiver and a maximum value of loss to ensure that the receiver has sufficient signal to operate properly. Uh, the loss budget is the amount of loss that the cable plant should have. Uh, it is calculated by adding the average loss of all the components used in the cable plant to get the loss estimated, the total estimated end-to-end -end loss. Uh, the loss budget has two uses uh, during the design stage to ensure that the cabling being designed will work with the links intended to be used over it and in the installation phase, comparing the calculated loss test results to ensure that the cable plant is installed properly. So what we do actually, what we do actually, what do we actually do with fiber? Well, the vast majority of fiber that's out there is duplex systems. So we have fiber pairs. We run two two strands of fiber, and the one is and one is used for transmit, and one is used uh, the other end is used. Uh, sorry, one is used for transmit in one direction, the other is used to transmit in the other direction. So transmit and receive depending on which side of it you're looking at. And it's not that duplex is the only configuration. There are plenty of ways to do things with a single strand of fiber, but this is typically kind of the cheapest and the easiest way. If you have just if you just have a simp the simplest component, and so so this is kind of holds true when you have fiber that's really cheap. If you have the simplest component. But like I said, it's perfectly capable of doing more complex things. It's just a cost-benefit trade-off um, as to how much you're willing to do. And what do we actually send over fiber? So remember, we're talking, we're taking digital signals and we're turning them into pulses of light. Um, Historically, the way that we've been, that's been done in the simplest way today is what's called IMDD, or Intensity Modulation with Direct Detection, or some people just call it Direct Detection. The way that typically works is through something called NRZ, which is Non-Return to Zero, and all this is is a fancy way of saying bright is one and dim is zero. It's literally just a little bit of binary code with bright and dim flashes done many billions of times a second. So modulation or the signal change is called BOD and it can happen billions of times per second. Uh, so the receiving end is just a little photo diode that detects these bright and dim signals and translates it back into ones and zeros. And this works really well and is the basis of everything through 16 gig fiber channel. Uh, once you start to go over 25 gigabod, uh, it starts to become prohibitively difficult. The reason you see advances in optical technology that gets you beyond 16 gig fiber channel is we're finally moving to something that's um, a little better than NRZ. For example, there's something called PAM4 or pulse amplitude modulation, and that's a very simplistic way to increase the bandwidth, and you're starting to see this more and more. And I'll pass it back to Mark. All right, thanks, Zach. That was uh, some tremendous information there. Thank you. Uh, I guess the next question, you know, we get this all the time uh, to the FCIA from, from our members is looking at the roadmap, they often ask, you know, can I use the same connectors uh, when the next generation or speed of fiber channel uh, increases? Um, Greg, can you help us out with that question? Yes, I can. I, I love this question because it's the easiest one to answer. Yes. 
yes, you can use the same, and not only do, do we say you can use the same, we, we, we want you to use the same. We've been using, as I said earlier, the SFP that's on the left there since, oh, not one gigabit, but uh, two GSC. Uh, before that, we were using something called G, uh, GBIC. Um, but yes, going on to, you know, through 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, whatever's next, um, we, we are planning on sticking with the SFP and the QSFP there on the right on our, our multi-lane um, applications. Um, it, it's, it's interesting to note that because Fiber Channel has always claimed to be at least two generations compatible backwards, um, as people were developing and, and using it and going to the next one, um, it generally almost turned out that they were somewhat forward compatible also because if they were running at 16, you know, at 8, and we were already starting to roll out 16, they knew they were safe, you know, rolling it, keeping the SFP. Now, you may lose some distances on some of your copper interconnects, um, as I talked about earlier, inside the rack, but it's, it's usually minimal um, from, from speed to speed because as that happens, we also end up, you know, putting in um, uh, extra, you know, more um, technology comes along in the chips to help. So we tend to, to, to be able to do that um, even at the same distances. But the absolute answer is yes, you can use the same connectors and we want you to use the same connectors. So yes, the SFP and the QSFP are the basic building blocks for most boxes. And, and back to Zach's point, you know, up, up in the um, op, optical area, it's all, you know, LC and, and MPO. So yes, you can definitely reuse a lot of this. I hope that answers that. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much, Greg. That that clears things up quite a bit. I guess uh, you know the next question we that we get quite often as well is is what's the difference between multi mode and single mode fiber types? Uh, yeah, that's a that's a question we actually get a lot, especially as you start to talk to people who. Uh, that haven't dealt with optical fiber that much. Uh, but the basic distinction uh, you can have when you talk about fiber is what's multi-mode and what's single-mode, or multi-mode versus single-mode. So I'll start with multi-mode. Multi-mode is a specifically designed to be used with typically cheaper light sources. Uh, what's happening here is you have an extremely wide core, and that allows you, uh, remember how we talked about core and cladding, that allows you to use less precisely, precisely focused, aimed, and calibrated lasers or LEDs or whatever light source. Uh, the downside to this is it becomes an extent of reach or the, your distance. Uh, so you really aren't able to get longer distances with multimode fiber, but you are able to work with typically uh, cheaper optics. Something to note is as uh, fiber channel speeds continue to increase, the limits on reach of current multimode fiber will decrease. So uh, this is because of something called modal dispersion. And I'll talk about that um, in a little bit. So there are a couple different types of multimode. Uh, there is OM1 and OM2, and these are the, your common orange fiber jackets you're going to see when you're walking around the data center. Uh, there are two versions. One it has a 62.5 micron core, and the other has a 50 micron core. They are very similar. Uh, they are designed for originally 100 meg, 1310 nanometer signal. And it really starts to fall off when you attempt to do 16 gig fiber channel or 10 gig ethernet. Uh, it becomes not scalable, not tenable. Uh, so then the fiber industry came up with something called OM3 and OM4. So there are different versions of it. Uh, and this is what's called laser optimized fiber. The outer jacket is usually aqua or light, light blue in color. Uh, so these are specifically designed to work with 850 nanometer short reach lasers. Uh, they are more easily, they more, more easily support speeds of 16 gig fiber channel. So instead of going approximately 26 meters on a OM1, you can get go 300 meters or more on 16 gig signal. And it's, 
pretty much required as far as multi-mode options go for higher speeds like 32 gig and 128 gig uh, fiber channel, which actually both of those um, uh, use 32 gig signals when you get down into the insides of it. And so you see this more and more in modern high-speed networking. Uh, but remember, multi-mode fiber itself isn't actually typically cheaper. A uh, multi-mode is typically more expensive relative to single-mode single, single mode fiber. So the reason you use it isn't to save money on the fiber, it's to save money on the transceivers. Um, so remember, multi-mode fiber allows you to use less precise transceivers. So single-mode fiber, on the other hand, um, and that's really used for super high bandwidth systems and long distances. Uh, so it has a much smaller core size and it has no inherent distance limitations caused by modal dispersion uh, that limits you with multi-mode. Uh, so typically you can see single mode support distances of about 80 kilometers. That seems to be the magic number without amplification. But single mode fiber has a massive array of fiber types. Uh, it also has a naming structure very similar to OM1 and OM2. It has OS1 and OS2, but it's not the same thing. Uh, so instead of it being about the type of fiber or about the properties of the fiber, it's actually about how it's buffered. So the buffer is the plastic coating around the core and the cladding. So OS1 is called a tight buffered fiber. It used, it's used on your standard patch cables or jumper cables. And OS2 is loose, and it's designed to be blown through ducts. Um, so your classic single-mode fiber, uh, probably the most common single-mode product out there is called uh, SMF28. That's actually a coin brand name, not a standard. Um, but there's a lot of others. Uh, there's l low water peak fiber, dispersion shifted fiber, non-zero dispersion shifted fiber, and uh, one you'll see in data centers um, called and sensitive fiber. But in general, um, know that there's a lot of different types. So here's a diagram showing the difference. Uh, you can see how the core is smaller in the single mode fiber, and you can see here in the multi mode fiber um, on the right, because the core is so big, you're able to see, get these modal reflections or different um, modes. Uh, you're able to kind of have the light bounce around more inside the fiber. And that's one of the major limitations on distance. It can, it's called modal dispersion. Uh, as the signal is sent down different modes, each mode takes a slightly different length of time, causing the information in the signal to potentially be received in it, the incorrect order, uh, depending on the distance. So in fiber optics, there are a couple different transmission bands or different windows that we talk about. Um, there's really three big ones. 850 nanometers is what's called the first window. So this is the area of highest attenuation. Uh, it's really only used for short reach applications. So you see this today with data centers and cabinet type applications. The uh, first window in, is a transmission band that is used with multimode fiber and uh, it is used with fiber channel as well. Uh, 13 10 nanometers, the second window is what's called the O band. So this was historically the point of zero dispersion. Uh, dispersion as it goes through fiber changes depending on the frequency of light. Uh, this was the spot that typically had the least dispersion. It was the easiest to work with. So when people first started working, uh, deploying fiber optic networks, this was the band that they used. And you see, the, you see this used today for your kind of medium reach applications or anything up to 10 kilometers, like long distance fiber channel. And it uses single mode fiber typically. For long reach applications, people have moved to the third window, which is the 15 nanometer window. Uh, it uses single mode as well. And this is called the C band and stands for conventional band. Uh, so it actually covers a range of 15, 1525 nanometers through 1565 nanometers and has the lower rate of attention, uh, attenuation over single mode fiber. Uh, it's used today almost, uh, almost all long reach 
for almost all long reach and for something called DWDM or dense wave division multiplexing application. Here you go, Mark. All right, thanks, Zach. That was that was good stuff. You know, we hear about a specification sometimes called bit error rate. Why exactly is bit error rate important in fiber channel? I'll try that. <laughs> All right, thanks, Mark. Um, bit error rate is important basically because it, as the top bullet says, it measures the data transmission performance of your system. So obviously, you know, the less loss you have, the, the better. You don't want to do lots of retries and lots, lots of lost data and that kind of thing. Um, you know, just even one decimal place, uh, you know, on that on that one piece of data coming across, I'd rather have the uh, the amount on the left versus the amount on the right deposited in my checking account. So it's very important, um, obviously, and it's it's a it's a measure that's used in a lot of architectures to 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 see exactly what is getting through. It's a bit confusing at times because there is actually two different definitions for bit or for BER. One is bit error rate. The other is bit error ratio. As you can see here, bit error rate is the number of errors during just a certain time unit. Bit error ratio, which is what the uh, fiber channel uses for their definition, is as it says here, the number of bits output from a receiver that differ from the corrected transmitted bits divided by the number of transmitted bits. It all sounds very wordy, but it's basically, um, you know, how many bits are getting corrupted. Um, through that period of bits that get through. The, periods of the, the bits that get through is more important than basically the time because more bits are getting through all the time with the faster bit rates going up. So it's really you want the number of bits to get through to be, to be undistorted or unhurt um, to get up there. So um, even as it says here at the bottom, you know, bit error rate is any, any bit that's, that hasn't been it has been distorted in some way, which it could be read as a zero when they thought it was a one. It could be somewhere in between, and it's just you know kind of swiggly. So, for fiber channel requires a bit error rate of less than a bit error ratio of less than or equal to 10 to the 12th, all the way up to 16 gigabit. And that's the raw. Now, when we go to 32 gigabit on uh, 32 JFC, there's a slight difference is because when we're using the same encoding that we did at 16, at 256, 257, um, that was fine at 16. We could still get well over the 10 to the 12. But when we went to the 32, we found that we needed to add forward error correction anyway. So we can do a raw bit error ratio of 10 to the 6th, incorporating the FEC, which is, is a way of um, correcting these bits before they get sent on the wire can still give us much better than a 10 to the 12th um, bit error ratio. Um, typically, fiber channel is kind of considered a lossless link. Um, and most systems out there that I know of, that anybody knows of, typically operate at better than 10 to the 16th bit error, rate, error ratio. Um, one of the reasons they don't put it into the standard at, at that high a number is it just takes a lot longer to test. So when you're testing huge, you know, configurations to test for that kind of bit error rate, it takes a long time. So in the 10 to the 12th, it seems to have still stood the test of time. One interesting note, though, for like fiber channel over Ethernet, um, when you're using the 10G base T and even the 40, um, it requires, you know, the CAT 6A and CAT 7 to meet 10 to the 12th requirements, which they've done a lot of work on to get there. So it's been interesting. But that's the big reason. That's the big brew around BER is it, it really is just a flat-out measure of good data getting through your, your system. That's, 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 the, main, that's sure. the main thing. So, fantastic. Th thanks, Greg. Uh, and and you know, to both of our presenters, Zach and, and Greg, thank you so much for 
uh, putting this uh, information together and presenting it to us. You know, in conclusion, um, I'd like to say, uh, given all the information that we've we've had so far, you know, we can we can draw that the reliability of fiber channel allows for many cabling options, going anywhere from one meter in length to over 10, 10 plus kilometers in length. The design goal should be to ensure simplicity for easier management, future expansion, and serviceability. And structured cabling can help meet that goal. Fiber channel merges the performance and reliability of local storage with the connectivity and distance of networks. So at this point, um, we haven't had any questions uh, on the material so far. If you'd like to use your Bright Talk interface to send us uh, a question, we still have a moment uh, to cover that. Um, just as a reminder, um, our next FCI webcast will be on FICON 101. It's on June 19th uh, at 10 a.m. Pacific time. Um, you can go to Bright Talk and follow this link it, to sign up and reserve your space for that webcast. Uh, also, uh, after this webcast, uh, we encourage you all to please rate this event. We value your feedback. Uh, we will post a Q&A blog at uh, httpfiberchannel.org uh, with the answers to all the questions we received today. Also, follow us on Twitter at, at FCIA News for updates on future FCIA webcasts, and visit our library of previous webcasts uh, from the FCIA um, at fiberchannel.org slash webcasts. And we have a tremendous library being starting to build up on the different topics We've already given everything from fiber channel fundamentals to uh, future developments and things like FC, NVMe over fabric. Okay, uh, we haven't had any questions so far, so um, I'd like to thank all the attendees for attending the webcast, and again, thank you to the presenters. And uh, um, oh, we have one question uh, just came up. Is there a a BICSI, B I C S I C E C available for this presentation. Not exactly sure what that means. Um, BICSI is yeah, another so standard. Go ahead. Yeah, it's a specific certification uh, through BICSI, and uh, the, the answer is probably no, but um, we could check into it. Okay, great. Thanks, Zach. Okay, uh, again, thanks to everybody for attending. We'll uh, look forward to seeing you at the next webcast. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, people.